Good afternoon. Welcome to a special presentation, the grand jury in a historical perspective. We have the honor of welcoming Dr. Joshua Tate, who is associate professor at SMU's Dedman School of Law, my alma mater law school. So I want you to give him a round of welcome. And Dr. Tate uh, started talking to me several months ago about the work that he's been doing with respect to grand juries. And I said this would be a wonderful opportunity for him to come do a presentation here at Southern University Law Center. And so it's uh, great to have you here. And uh, we have our great photographer Steve here. <laughs> and uh, 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 I want uh, this class, we have faculty in this class, uh, folks here who are going to learn a lot today. So I thank you for coming and spending some time with us. Dr. Tate. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Pierre, for giving me the opportunity to come here. Uh, it's wonderful to be here in Baton Rouge, my first visit uh, to this city. And thank you all for coming. So the topic of my lecture today is the grand jury and historical perspective. And as we all know, the grand jury as an institution has uh, come in for quite a bit of criticism recently, uh, particularly with regard to some uh, cases of uh, police, what they call police-involved shootings, where civilians were uh, shot or, or killed by policemen, and the grand jury decided not to indict those police officers. And I am not an expert on criminal law. Um, if any of you have taken criminal law, you know as much about it as I do. Um, and if there are any criminal law professors in here, then uh, you know much more about it than I do. But I am a legal historian. And as a legal historian, whenever there is any kind of controversy about an institution, my first question, the question I ask is, why do we have this institution? What was its original purpose? And is that original purpose a purpose that still makes sense today? Because if it is, then I think there should be a presumption that we need to retain that institution if the reason why it was created still applies. But if the original purpose no longer applies, then we ought to be open to reforming or even abolishing that institution. So what I'm going to explain to you today is that the institution of the grand jury was created 850 years ago, and it was created for a purpose that no longer applies today. And so as we consider different alternative ways of changing uh, the institution of the grand jury, we should um, keep in mind that it was created for very different reasons. So what I'm going to do is I'm first going to talk about the uh, place of the grand jury in our Bill of Rights, and also about some of these cases which you've all have heard of um, where the grand jury decisions have been controversial. Then I'm going to take us back in time 850 years to talk about uh, the origin of the grand jury and then I will explain how the institution has evolved uh, over the centuries since then. So let's begin with the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. Um, there are a lot of things in the Fifth Amendment, and uh, one of the things that the Fifth Amendment protects is the right uh, to a grand jury. So it says, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime uh, unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. So that's the basis for the federal constitutional right to a grand jury. If any of you uh, have an interest in uh, medieval legal history, I'm sure you've heard of Magna Carta, and many of you who don't have this interest have also heard of it. Um, the language of the Fifth Amendment actually is closely parallel to the language of the famous Clause 39 of Magna Carta. Magna Carta here at the left says, no free man is to be arrested or imprisoned or deceased or outlawed or exiled or in any way destroyed, save by the lawful judgment of his people or by the law of the land. The Fifth Amendment starts off similarly, no person, and then it goes on to say uh, that none of these bad things can happen without a presentment or indictment of a grand jury or um, 
be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, of course, in 1789, they might as well have said no free person because uh, this, these protections did not apply to uh, the slaves. Um, but uh, otherwise, it's quite parallel. And that is not a coincidence. Because some of the first state constitutions from 1776 contain word for word that language of Clause 39 of Magna Carta. Um, the founding fathers of this country were very interested in Magna Carta because Magna Carta was an example of the king being forced to respect the rule of law. And that was a concept they were really interested in. In fact, uh, the very first great seal of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shows a patriot who has a sword in one hand and a copy of Magna Carta in the other hand. So that's the origin of the grand jury right uh, in the U.S. Constitution. Now, interestingly, unlike most of the protections in the Bill of Rights, the Fifth Amendment right to a grand jury has not been incorporated against the states. So as you know, um, the state of Texas or the state of Louisiana can't restrict my freedom of speech. They can't take away my guns. Uh, they can't quarter troops in my house. I don't know about that one, actually. Uh, they can't do all these things because the Fifth Amendment has been incorporated against the states by virtue of the Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, or, sorry, the, those particular provisions have been incorporated. But this particular right, um, the right to a grand jury, has not been incorporated. And what that means is that the states are free not uh, to have a grand jury for state cases. And, in fact, about half of the states do not have grand juries in state cases. And to the extent that they have them, they're free to curtail the right to a grand jury as much as they uh, think is appropriate. Now, I know very little about the law of Louisiana, but I did manage to find your constitutional provision uh, recognizing a right to a grand jury in Louisiana. It says, whoops, uh, it says, prosecution of a felony shall be initiated by indictment or information, but no person shall be held to answer for a capital crime or a crime punishable by life imprisonment except on indictment by a grand jury. And then it clarifies what an indictment is, that an indictment is a written accusation of crime made by a grand jury. So there is a right to a grand jury in Louisiana under the Louisiana Constitution, but not by virtue of the uh, Fifth Amendment. So that means that here, in this state, you have a right to a grand jury in uh, serious cases of felony, both in state court and in federal court. Now let me talk about some of those cases, um, which I know you've all heard of, um, partly because they didn't become cases, because the grand jury decided not to indict. So this is the first one. In Missouri, a police officer killed an unarmed teenager named Michael Brown. And um, this was very upsetting to many people. And the grand jury that was investigating this decided not to indict the police officer for the killing of Michael Brown. And there were many protests in Ferguson and uh, in other places about this, about the grand jury's decision. People thought that this was unfair, that the process was not objective. Another case, which you've all heard of, Eric Garner in New York City was put into a chokehold by the police and uh, killed. And once again, the grand jury decided not to indict the police officer who killed Eric Garner. And once again, this was met with uh, protests. A third case. In Cleveland, in Ohio, uh, Tamir Rice, wh who was a 12-year-old boy, was shot and killed once again by a police officer, uh, this time because he was holding a toy gun, which the police officer uh, allegedly believed was a real gun and felt threatened by. Now, one thing that distinguishes this case from some of the others is that because Tamir Rice was only 12 years old, if Tamir Rice had actually committed murder and had been put on trial and convicted by the state, the state would still not be able to execute him because he was a, uh, a child, right? But this police officer executed him with no due process uh, because the police officer felt threatened. And so this, again, was obviously very controversial. 
This time there was a consequence of the grand jury's decision not to indict the police officer, which was that the prosecutor uh, who was running for re-election in Ohio, uh, the prosecutor did not win his primary, so he's going to lose his, uh, his position now, uh, because people thought that he didn't make a strong enough case, he didn't bring all the relevant evidence uh, to the grand jury, and that that was the reason why they didn't convict. So those three cases obviously have a lot in common. Now there's a fourth case I wanted to talk about, which I don't know if, if it made the news over here, um, but it made big news in Houston uh, and also in other places in Texas. So this was a case involving Planned Parenthood. And what happened was a couple of activists went and met with Planned Parenthood executives and secretly recorded some conversations uh, during which allegedly uh, some comments were made which involved the unauthorized uh, sale of fetal tissue. So this, these facts went to the grand jury and they were expected to decide whether to bring an indictment against Planned Parenthood for the statements that were made involving fetal tissue. The grand jury surprised a lot of people because not only did they not indict Planned Parenthood, they indicted the activists for making those secret recordings because that, uh, the grand jury thought, had probable cause to uh, break the law. So this decision was also criticized. And it was criticized uh, by some politicians who had not had much to say about the cases uh, involving the police officers who killed Michael Brown, uh, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, and others. Um, this time the criticism was coming from people who thought that this was a runaway grand jury, that they should have indicted Planned Parenthood, uh, and uh, they shouldn't have the authority to indict these activists. So, one thing that everyone could agree on, I think, is that this is a controversial institution. When you have criticism coming from all different uh, parts of the political spectrum in different kinds of cases, then as a historian, I ask, why did we originally have this institution? What was its original purpose? So let me take you back now in time 850 years, because this year is actually the 850th anniversary of the grand jury. I don't know if that's being celebrated uh, anywhere, um, but it's the 850th anniversary. Uh, we celebrated our 10-year wedding anniversary, but the other ones we kind of missed. Um, okay, so the grand jury in the United States is directly descended from an institution that was created by the English King Henry II in the year 1166 uh, in a decision that was called the Assize of Clarendon. Um, what this was, it was a formal council of the king and his barons held at the king's hunting lodge in Clarendon in England. At this time, there was no such thing as parliament. Um, that just wasn't a concept that had developed yet. And so this was as close as you would get to, a, um, to legislation. It was issued by the king, but in the presence of these uh, barons. And what the Assize of Clarendon did was it called upon mem uh, individuals in all the local communities of England to tell the king's officials whether there were any persons in their communities who were suspected of having committed certain serious crimes, specifically robbery, murder, and theft. At this time in England, there were no professional police. There were no paid state prosecutors. So this was a mechanism for finding out information about who was suspected of having committed crimes before they have any police to investigate those crimes. Now, to understand this size of Clarendon, I need to tell you a little bit about King Henry II. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie The Lion in Winter. It's kind of an old movie, but uh, uh, it's about King Henry II and his three sons and his wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, we have to understand a little bit about Henry in order to see why he did this. So Henry came to the throne at the death of his cousin Stephen. Henry's mother was Matilda, and Matilda was the daughter of King Henry I. So when King Henry I died, there was a dispute between Matilda, who was the mother of Henry II, and Stephen, who was the closest male heir of Henry I, because Henry I was not survived by any sons. 
And at that time, they had not yet resolved the question of what happens when the king dies without leaving any sons. Of course, today, the answer is that the oldest daughter becomes queen. That's why Queen Elizabeth II is the queen. But at that time, it hadn't been resolved. So for most of the period between the death of Henry's grandfather and his own ascension to the throne, there was a civil war between the partisans of Matilda and Stephen. Toward the end of Stephen's reign, uh, shortly before Henry II came to the throne, there was a peace agreement between uh, Stephen's uh, supporters and Matilda's supporters. And the agreement was that Stephen would recognize the claim of Matilda's son Henry to be Stephen's successor, but Matilda would then stop challenging the legitimacy of Stephen's reign. So that was the peace Stephen then dies, and Henry II comes over, and he's the undisputed king of England. But his number one priority is he has to restore order in the kingdom. Because if he doesn't do that, if there continues to be unrest and conflict, it's only a matter of time before some rival claimant comes out and says, we've got to get rid of Henry, um, and because he has to uh, restore order in the kingdom. Now, another thing you have to understand about Henry, and this, this will be clear if you watch that movie, The Lion in Winter, is that England is just a part of Henry's possessions. This territory here in orange, this is called the Angevin Empire. Now, why is it called that? Uh, because Henry was king of England, but he also controlled all these territories in France, including the county of Anjou. So that's why it's called the Angevin Empire, after the county of Anjou. So he controlled the Duchy of Normandy, Brittany. He controlled the Aquitaine because he was married to Eleanor of Aquitaine. He controlled about half of France. In France, he was not the king. There was a king of France, and it wasn't Henry. And so Henry owed feudal obligations to the king of France. But... In reality, Henry was much more powerful than the King of France because he was the King of England in addition to having all of this land in France. He also controlled some of uh, Ireland as well. So throughout Henry's reign, and it, continuing into the reigns of his son uh, Richard and his son John, who was the one who agreed to, finally agreed to Magna Carta, there was a conflict between the King of France and Henry and his successors because the King of France resented the fact that his vassals had so much more power than he did because they had all this uh, land in France and the Kingdom of England. Um, Henry resented the fact that he wasn't the King of France. Uh, he resented the fact that he owed this feudal obligation to the king of France, who was much less powerful than him. So there's this bubbling conflict. And when Henry's younger son, John, comes to the throne, uh, John loses almost all of the land in France, and that's the immediate cause for Magna Carta. But the point of all this is, to the extent that Henry has any extra money, any extra resources, he cannot afford to spend that on developing a system of investigation and prosecution of crimes. If he has any extra money, he's going to spend it on castles, and he's going to spend it on mercenaries, and he's going to spend it on bribing other uh, European monarchs to support his position uh, in this conflict with the King of France. So he has to come up with an effective but affordable way of investigating crimes to restore order in England. As I said, there were no professional police in the time of King Henry II. If a person was caught red-handed at the scene of the crime with blood on their hands or with the stolen goods in their hands, the way that that was dealt with was the person who found that, uh, that criminal would shout out, 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 out. And everybody in the village would grab uh, their pitchforks or their sticks or whatever implements of destruction they had and go after this person. And then they would get a very quick trial, uh, about five minutes, and then they would be executed. So here you have an illustration. Uh, this person here has, is a criminal who's been killed through this procedure. Someone's bringing him and telling the king's official, uh, just so you know, we killed this guy because he was caught red-handed. Right um, Now, that procedure was certainly efficient and affordable because it didn't cost the king anything. 
But the problem was, it was only uh, used when the person was actually caught red-handed. And most of the time, there's not going to be uh, blood on the hands of the person who committed the crime. So they have to have some way of investigating cases where crimes have been uh, committed in secret or where the evidence is not, um, not so obvious. And that's where the Assize of Clarendon came in. So, this is the actual language of the Assize of Clarendon. It says, well, it's, it's the English translation. It's originally in Latin. It says, King Henry, on the advice of all his barons for the preservation of peace and for the maintenance of justice, has decreed that inquiry shall be made through 12 of the more lawful men of the hundred and through four of the more lawful men of each vill, upon oath that they will speak the truth, whether there be in their hundred or vill any man accused or notoriously suspect of being a robber or murderer or thief, or any who is a receiver of robbers or murderers or thieves, since the Lord King has been king. So the local communities are expected to send representatives to the king's officials to tell the king's officials whether anybody in their neighborhood is suspected of having committed a serious crime. If someone, well, I'll tell you what the trial was, but before I get to that, um, the reason why this was effective is because at this time, England, um, most of England followed a system of agricultural organization known as the open field system. So here you can see what this was about. So in the center of this community, we have these little cottages, and it says tofts. So they're numbered one, two, three, four, and so on. Then you have all these strips of land in these different fields. And the person who lives in this cottage here would have this strip here, this strip here, this strip here, this strip here, and so on. So they each, each would get their own strip of land in all the fields. The advantage of this, from the perspective of an agrarian uh, society, is that in any given year, you might have to let one of these fields lie fallow so that it could be um, fertilized and it would be more fertile in future years. But if that particular field belonged to one person, then they would go hungry the next year because they wouldn't get their share of the harvest. So rather than do that, whoops, they would, uh, they would simply uh, divide each field up into strips. Now, the, the significance of that is if you live in this community and you live in one of these cottages, which are clustered together for protection, so you've got all your neighbors right next door to you, you're spending the day in the fields working next door, right, right next to your neighbors. If anyone is suspected of having done anything wrong in this community, everyone is going to know that. If someone had something stolen, and then a couple of weeks later, someone else in the community shows up and they've got on some fancier clothes than they had before, everyone's going to know that's the gossip, and everyone's going to know that's the person who's suspected of having stolen those goods doesn't mean that's correct, but it means that everyone will know that's the gossip in the community. So when Henry goes out and tells the local uh, people to come to his officials and tell them whether anyone's suspected of committing a crime, he's taking advantage of the informational resource in these uh, communities. So, if a person was presented as a suspected criminal, they would not get a jury trial. That was too uh, time-consuming and costly at this time. Instead, what they would get is they would get put to the ordeal of water. So here's the way that this worked. So here's the suspected criminal here. He's been tied to this rope, and he's being lowered down into some kind of body of water by these two guys. They're going to see whether he floats in the water. Because if he floats in the water, that means he's guilty. But if he sinks into the water, that means he's innocent because the water is receiving him and therefore he must be innocent. Um, if you've seen the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail, maybe more people have seen that, um, there's a scene in there where they uh, give a trial to the woman who's accused of being a witch by weighing her to see if she weighs the same as a duck because ducks, ducks float in water and wood floats in water and wood burns and witches burn. Remember this? Anyone remember this? Um, that's uh, actually not that different 
In fact, it's probably slightly more sophisticated than the actual mechanism that was used here to decide whether people were guilty or innocent. Now, medieval people were not stupid. They were just as smart or as dumb as the rest of us today, right? So they didn't understand all of the details of biology that we understand, but they weren't so stupid as to think that somebody is more likely to float in water if they were guilty of a crime. So why did they accept this? The reason why they accepted it is because during this procedure, a priest would have been present. The priest would have called upon God to bless this ordeal and to perform a miracle so that if the person who is being put to the test is innocent, God would perform a miracle and make that person sink into the water. And if the person's guilty, apparently God would perform a miracle and let that person float. So the, the priest's presence there was crucial because if the priest wasn't there, nobody would accept this as legitimate. Only because the priest was there, people believed in the power of priests to invoke God's blessing, and they believed in the power of miracles. That's why they accepted this as valid. Okay, so it's working pretty well. You've got a mechanism for finding out who's suspected of committing crimes, and you've got a procedure for trying them, and neither of these things cost the king anything. All right, so then there's a problem. Under, or by the time that, uh, that Henry's son John is king, toward the end of John's reign, the Pope conducts a Lateran Council, a, a council in Rome. And at that Lateran Council, the Pope decides that from that point forward, priests will not be allowed to participate in the ordeals. The context of this is that this is the time in Europe when the great universities are starting to flourish, like the University of Oxford, University of Paris, and so on. And those universities are rediscovering the learning of the ancient Greeks and Romans. And from that ancient Greek or Roman perspective, this ordeal seems like a barbaric practice. It seems like the kind of thing that they would not approve of in the modern age of 1215. So the church doesn't say that these ordeals are not valid. The church just says priests are not going to participate in these anymore. But of course, once the priests are no longer involved, nobody accepts these things as valid anymore. So they have to come up with an alternative. So they puzzle over this for a few years. They're not sure what to do. But then they come up with a suggestion. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to ask the defendant how would you like to be tried? Okay, so we'll give this person a choice. The correct answer was by God and the country. And that meant I would like a jury trial. Another jury trial after you've already been presented by the grand jurors. So that was okay. If that's what you want, we'll give you a jury trial. If the defendant said something else, if the defendant said, I'd like to be tried by the ordeal of water, please, um, the judges would say, oh, great, today we've got a comedian. Um, let's see what we do with comedians. What we do with the comedian is we're going to put him down on the ground and we're going to start stacking heavy weights on his chest until he either changes his mind and decides that he would like a jury trial or is crushed to death by the heavy weights. Um, now, you might be surprised to hear that most people did not elect to be crushed to death, that most people chose to have a jury trial. But even more surprising is that, or actually surprising, is that some people did allow themselves to be crushed to death. And the reason is because if you owned any land and were convicted of a felony, your land would be forfeit to the crown. But if you were never convicted, if you were just crushed to death, um, your land could pass to your heirs. And that was important to some people who owned land. But most people who have been accused of being robbers, murderers, or thieves don't own any land anyway, and so that wasn't a consideration, so they would take their chances with the jury. Now, after this, in the 14th century, one of those things happens which changes European society forever, and that is the Black Death, the bubonic plague. Right? So the plague comes through England and kills 40% of the population. Imagine that. Um, imagine if almost half the people you know were killed in a plague. Right? Terrible, terrible consequences. So everyone lost friends, everyone lost family members. But for some people, there were advantages to this. 
Because if you imagine all those people out there working in the open fields, some of them probably would have rather been doing something else. And after the Black Death, there are a lot of vacancies available in the professions, such as we need cobblers, we need blacksmiths, uh, and so on. We, all of the skilled professions now have uh, help wanted signs in front of their uh, doors because so many people have been killed. So some of the laborers who are working in these open fields decide that they would be better off moving to the cities and taking on new work because that great, leads to greater social mobility for them and also for their children. So what happens is you have a urbanizing of the society and it starts at this time and it just continues through the industrial revolution. The cities get more people, the rural areas get depopulated, eventually a lot of these open field villages get enclosed and they use them for grazing, they don't use them for farming, okay? So what does that mean? Well, when people move into the cities, you can no longer expect them to know anything about their neighbors. If you ask me whether anyone in my neighborhood is suspected of committing a crime, I would say no, but I only know this person over here and this person over here. The rest of the people on the street I've never even met. Uh, and particularly if I live in a big city like London, I might be totally new to the neighborhood and so is everybody else, so people are moving around all the time. And you can't expect to use the knowledge of people in the city of London as an informational resource about their neighbors. So that just isn't going to work anymore. So that means that the original purpose of the grand jury has already become obsolete by the 14th century. But the grand jury survives because it starts to perform a different function. The grand jury starts to be used to filter out some of the less meritorious prosecutions um, that are being brought because the prosecutions still are not being brought by state prosecutors. There are no police, there are no prosecutors. The prosecutors are the individual victims of the crimes or their family members. So people come to these officials called the justices of the peace, and these were part-time uh, gentlemen who were doing this on the side. Um, they come to the justice of the peace and say, I've been a victim of a crime. And this person, uh, John, is, is the criminal, and uh, I want him to be uh, put on trial and executed. Well, the problem with that is sometimes the person who's making the accusation might just be doing it because they don't like the person they're accusing. Maybe the person they're accusing is innocent. So maybe they're making up an allegation which is just patently false, but they're doing it to retaliate against somebody they don't like. So the grand jury, which still exists, starts to serve the function of filtering out some of the less meritorious prosecutions from going to a jury. Because once the prosecution goes to a jury, you're taking a significant risk, if you're the defendant, that you're going to get convicted whether you're innocent or not. And of course, for people who had a reputation worth protecting, once you've been put on trial, that already damages your reputation. And so the grand jury starts serving a different role, and that is to filter out the meritless accusations and keep them from going to the jury. Now, I'm going to have to go through a few hundred years of English history very quickly. Um, so in the 16th century, they have a king named Henry VIII who wants to get a divorce because his wife can't produce a male heir. So the Pope won't give him a divorce, so he declares himself to be head of the Church of England and gives himself a divorce. Then for a few kings and queens after that, they're fighting about whether England is going to be pro Protestant or Catholic. They eventually end up with a king whose tendencies are toward Catholicism, and this is not favorably regarded by Parliament, so Parliament executes that king, and then they have a dictator appointed, Oliver Cromwell, to replace him. They eventually realize that having a dictator isn't quite as fun as they thought it would be. They bring the king's son back over, and that's the restoration. Then they realized that maybe that wasn't such a great idea either because the king's uh, younger brother turns out to be uh, even more Catholic than the king that they executed. So eventually they decide, 
let's bring over the king's daughter, Mary, and her husband, because they're Protestant, we can tolerate them, bring them over, and that's the glorious revolution. Okay, so now you have William and Mary in the 17th century. Everybody is happy, or at least the Protestants in Parliament are happy. They've finally got the monarch that they want, uh, and not the monarch that's been forced on them by the, um, the succession. So, you've got William and Mary. Well, William and Mary have the same problem that Henry II had, and that is they quickly need to restore order to the kingdom because if they don't, there's Stuart pretenders out there who are ready to come back and take the kingdom over. So Parliament has to make sure that this new king and queen are not uh, disturbed by disorder in the kingdom. So they start passing some statutes uh, to deal with this. So this is an example of one of those statutes. This is an act for encouraging the apprehending of highwaymen. Um, this is from the late uh, 17th century. Now why are they needing to do this? Well, in an urbanizing society, an increasing amount of crime is going to take the form of organized crime. Because in a big city, you're going to have rings of pickpockets. or pickpockets. Um, so, you know, there might be a, a very small uh, gang where one or two people distract the person while the other one takes the, uh, takes the purse uh, away from them. Or you might have more elaborate organized crime, such as highway robbery, where you've got a whole bunch of people who are hanging out in the forest uh, waiting for carriages to go by to rob them, right? Now, when you start talking about organized crime, there's a significant disincentive as a citizen from bringing a accusation against an organized crime ring, and that is that you might find yourself killed by the organized crime ring in retaliation for having accused them before you ever get to the point of having a trial. So, in that context, people are nervous about bringing these accusations. But once again, they still don't have professional police. They still don't have prosecutors. So what Parliament decides to do is to give people a financial incentive. So that's what these statutes do. This one says, Whereas the highways and roads within the Kingdom of England and Dominion of Wales have been of late time more infested with thieves and robbers than formerly, for want of due and sufficient encouragement given and means used for the discovery and apprehension and so on. So it goes, goes on to say, we're going to start paying people a reward um, if they successfully prosecute a highway robber. Okay, so now you have a financial incentive which weighs in the scale uh, in favor of bringing that prosecution. The problem is that same incentive also applies to people who want to prosecute innocent people because they'll still get the reward as long as those people are convicted. So this actually creates a whole new profession of thief taking. So you start to get people who make a living by bringing prosecutions against their fellow subjects uh, and collecting the reward when those people are convicted. This is a uh, woodcutting healer. This is an illustration of a master thief taker educating his young apprentice on the Ten Commandments of thief taking, one of which is thou shalt steal. So whoever drew this cartoon probably wasn't a big fan of thief taking. Um, these thief takers are, um, th they, their tactics are awful. They will do things like they'll go up to somebody and say, I'm going to prosecute you for highway robbery unless you agree to be my witness against him, in which case you and I can split the reward uh, and uh, you know, you'll, you'll get some money instead of being executed. So they do these kinds of things. They, they make threats to people and then they take advantage of the crown witness system to, um, to, to uh, use this person as a witness against some other person. So all this is going on and it's not a secret. The judges know that there's a problem. But out of this come a lot of nice things that we uh, regard today as very important in criminal law. One of the things that comes out of it is that the defendants are given the right to an attorney. Because previously, they weren't, defendants in criminal cases were not allowed to have an attorney representing them, even if they could pay for it. Because the idea was if you're guilty, 
That will be evident from your answers to the victim's uh, allegations. And if you're innocent, your innocence will shine through from your excellent answers. Now, we know that's nonsense, right? Because people who are nervous might sound like they're guilty, but at that time they believe that. But because of all this thief-taking nonsense, the judges start to allow people to have criminal uh, defense attorneys. In addition, once you have attorneys, the attorneys can object to things. They can object to evidence that's prejudicial or that's not relevant and so on. So you get all these rules of evidence, like the hearsay rules, starting to develop out of this. But for our purposes, the most significant development that comes out of this is the creation of a professional police force. So they get fed up with all of this. And beginning in the 1750s, you have these people called the Bro Bow Street Runners who are acting as a uh, unofficial police organization. 1792, Parliament authorizes the first paid police force for the city of London. That's just the city of London. And then in 1829, that gets expanded to cover the whole metropolitan area of London. And you have the famous uh, Bobbies here, the Metropolitan Police. Now, taking this story over to the United States, again, a lot of things happen. Alexander Hamilton, and there's a million things he hasn't done, but then he does these things, and you have the United States, right? So in the United States, we have some similar problems, but we also have some problems that are unique to our country. One of the problems that they start having in the 19th century is they have a lot of immigrants coming over from Ireland, and the immigrants are not being well received by the so-called Native Americans. And the Native Americans back then, uh, that term was, did not mean American Indians. That term meant people uh, who wanted to make America great again uh, because they had been living there before the Irish came over. Um, so you, when they, as these Irish immigrants come over, they're in conflict with the people who are already there, and you have riots, you have unrest, and so on. And so to keep the peace, some of the big cities, like New York City and Boston and Philadelphia, start hiring professional police forces just like uh, in London. So here's a picture of the early NYPD officers in their uniforms. So these police forces are authorized to keep the peace, but they can also investigate crimes. And then the police start serving the role of uh, preparing the facts that goes to a prosecutor, and the prosecutor decides whether to bring uh, a, uh, or to whether to put this to a grand jury to try to get an indictment. So, now we have something which is starting to look like the system that we have today. And we have it both in England at this point, and we have it in the United States. Now, toward the end of the 19th century, or actually even earlier than that in England, people start to ask, Remind me why we have the grand jury again? Because we have professional police who are doing the investigation. We have professional prosecutors who are bringing the charges. We have juries to decide whether people are guilty or innocent. So why do we need this grand jury? And it's an excellent question. And in England, in 1933, Parliament answers this by abolishing the grand jury. So they don't have grand juries anymore in England. We have it in the United States because the right to a grand jury is in the Fifth Amendment. We have it in Texas and Louisiana because our respective state constitutions guarantee a grand jury right in uh, felony cases in state court. But, and now I will conclude, the fact that we have it is not a sufficient reason to keep it or to maintain it the way it is, particularly when you take into account that the original purpose for this institution served a completely different uh, society, a completely different context, and uh, that reason no longer applies today. So as people think about reforming this system, we should not feel bound by the past, we should not feel bound to retain this as it is just because it has existed for 850 years. So thank you, thank you very much and I welcome your questions. Yeah, oh thank you, it's a little hot. Yes ma'am. Good.
Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I, I want to emphasize that I'm not taking a position on these issues because I, it's out of my realm of expertise. Having said that, I would say a couple things about um, this issue. One is that the circumstances that hold when you have a police officer who's killed a citizen are totally different from when you're talking about an ordinary citizen who's being you know, possibly charged with a crime. Because in the case of a police officer, the grand jury is being used to shield um, an officer of the state from suffering the consequences of what they did to a citizen. But in most cases, the grand jury is protecting a citizen from um, being prosecuted by the state, right? Um, so it's different. And in some jurisdictions, for particularly in Ohio, the reforms that are being put on the table involve changing the procedure, but only for cases where there's a police officer who's uh, being subject to prosecution. And so, for example, in Ohio, they're saying maybe we should um, we should have an independent prosecutor. So rather than having the prosecutor be the person who's regularly dealing with the police and has a close relationship with them, let's bring in an independent person, maybe from some other part of the state or even another state. Uh, and maybe we should let the defendant uh, or the the victim uh, have their testimony um, given at the at the before the grand jury. See that element of secrecy, which is so important or allegedly important when we're talking about a regular citizen. Maybe that doesn't matter when you're talking about something that is being replayed on uh, the internet over and over, and which everybody has seen in the news. Why do we need secrecy in that context? So those are some of the arguments that are being made about police-involved shootings and the use of grand juries. Um, again, I'm not taking a position on whether those are the right um, approaches or not, but I do think we should keep in mind that the set of answers that applies in one context might not make sense in the other context. Yes, ma'am. I think that's a, a valid point. If you turn that around, though, in some cases, the grand jury could be used to protect a prosecutor from facing the consequences of bringing an action against a state official. So say you've got a mayor of the town who's hopelessly corrupt, taking bribes and so on. Uh, if the prosecutor just indicts that person or you know, brings, brings in a criminal case against that person, they might lose their job. But if they say, well, it wasn't me, it was the grand jury, the grand jury is just 12 random people, then um, they could be used as, as a way of, uh, of protecting citizens from the state, just as it can be used to protect the state from the citizens. Yes, sir, in the back. The, the antiquatedness of the thinking of people involved with the system? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what, that, what you mean by that, except that, um, I'm sorry, you said? Okay, well, what, well, <laughs> what, what, you wanna, uh, uh, well, okay. I, I think you okay. that it's not so much that the system in place, that, that the thing is broken, but the people that are operating the thing is broken. Okay, yeah, I think I understand what you mean. So the, the problem is, like, let's say that we, we, we guaranteed that in each of those three cases, Tamir Rice, uh, Michael Brown, and Eric Garner, that those police officers were put on trial. Maybe the police officers would have just been acquitted by the jury because the juries uh, suffer from a lot of the same biases um, that might be preventing the grand jury from bringing this. So, but that's, so, it, um, so the, if the system has a problem, uh, particularly with regard to race, and uh, uh, people's prejudices are coming into the system, then changing the institutions may not be the solution. 
I think that uh, that makes sense to a certain extent, um, and I don't know how we solve that problem. Uh, that, that's that's very difficult to deal with. Um, you know, one one question I've uh, I, I went to Venezuela uh, a couple years ago, and Venezuela has huge huge problems now with the rule of law, uh, and uh, the courts are totally controlled by the, um, the executive. You know, if if Venezuela were to adopt our system of grand juries. Chances are that that whole process would just get infected by the same uh, the same problems, the same corruption, the same state control that has has prevented justice from from existing uh, currently. So just changing institutions may not help if the whole system uh, suffers from these these problems. But I do think that there's some advantage to having a, having institutions that can function uh, because you know think how much worse things might be if we had. Um, if, if it were up to, say, President Trump to decide who goes to jail and who doesn't, right? So you can imagine things being worse than, than the way they are now. Um, so, <laughs> not that that helps us. That would be the last question. I want to thank Dr. Cage for coming with us. And, uh, I hope you learned a lot today. And uh, I want to thank you for spending your time with us. And uh, I appreciate you uh, coming, Chair. Privilege to come. Thank you.